Hi everyone, welcome to another Alia Graphic Creator Chat. I'm Yurgi from Kingston Libraries in Victoria, and today I'm very excited to be talking to Cameron Davis, the brain behind a series of comics of Rose and Dahlia. Anyway, let's dive in. Hi Cameron, how are you going? Great mate, how are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm in Melbourne, and so I'm uh, in what it's called a hard lockdown. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, otherwise, um, I think I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, we're, we're, we're handling it okay up here. I mean, I never want to leave the house anyway. I have comic books and video games here. Where am I going? So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know you guys, are, like, it's so much tougher down there. So uh, I hope you're all doing okay. It's, it's rough. I think it's uh, uh, it, it's really strange when you have uh, you know a kid doing remote learning and then two adults uh, doing work from home uh, kind of thing. Very strange. But anyway, uh, what well, I think we're doing pretty well. We're handling we're handling it pretty well. And we've never been together for so long. Uh, you know, yeah, all, all three of us at the same time at home, um, and it has its good things as well. Like, you know, I've started watching Dragon Ball with my son for the first time. He's nine. <laughs> it's bonding. Yeah, it's bonding. It's bonding. He's loving it. We, we watched all of Avatar, The Last Airbender as well. So that's oh, good. Fantastic. We're reading The Hobbit together. Uh, so reading it, not watching it. No, reading The Hobbit. Uh, good, there's no okay, way he cool. will watch the movies before, <sighs> uh, before reading the books. So. Oh, skip it. It's fine. The Hobbit movies, actually. Yeah, a big disappointment, but yeah, I think he loves yeah. it. But anyway, for those who don't know, uh, who is Cameron Davis? Can you tell us about yourself and what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, so I live up here in Brisbane with my wife and two cats, and I make comic books. Um, I have a boring day job, but who cares about that? Uh, we make comics, like this one, brand new, Rosendalia, third course, uh, always be plugging. Um, they're, they're comics about food and friendship and the fun in between. Excellent. Yeah, so I've been making comics for about, um, pretty hardcore, about 10 years now. Uh, Rose started back in 2015 and I've been doing other stuff before that, but yeah, so it's been a long slog to get to this point. Yeah. Uh, and did you read comics as a kid and oh. what kind of comics? Yeah, um, I was a comics tragic. Uh, really started getting into them about like 10 or 11. They started getting passed around school. Um, and a lot of Archie books, no surprise. Um, they were a big deal in, in the schoolyard. Um, one, thing, actually, one thing I noticed was that like everyone in my class like were reading and passing comic books around between each other. And everyone was reading Archie books. And, um, but only the boys were reading G.I. Joe and Transformers. And I thought, oh, that's, in that was back like the mid eighties when Marvel were doing those series. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, like you can't share some books, like some of them weren't being shared around with others. And I was like, I want to make comics that everyone can enjoy. Um, and I first started like doing like silly doodle comics like that and making other kids in the class laugh. And that was a good feeling. So I was like, okay. I'll keep following that uh, instead of doing schoolwork. Um, so yeah, a lot of Archie growing up. Then I really got into like the Marvel superhero stuff as a, as a young teenager. Spider-Man um, uh, was a big one, of course. Uh, and, and then what happened when high school started, the first day of high school, I remember um, going in there going, oh, I, just, I just don't know if I can do this. Like high school is such a grown up thing. And then across the road from the school, there were all these little corner shops. And one of them was a comic book shop that, had, that was just opening that week. And I don't know how things were, were um, where you were growing up as, as a lad, but comic shops were an unheard of thing for me growing up, especially in Brisbane. There was maybe one that was in the city, uh, maybe Daily Planet. And um, they, that, and I got to go there maybe once a year. So it was like, oh my God, a comic shop in my hometown across the road from school. This is incredible. So a week later when it opened up, I went into the school, got my name signed off on the roll, walked over to the comic shop and went, so can I, can I just help out? Like, you know, 
I, and they put me to work just like, you know, reordering the back issue bins or filling out the weekly orders or anything like that. And I pretty much didn't go to school since. <laughs> like it was just the teachers would come over looking for like truant kids and they'd hide me in the back room uh, <laughs> just because I was just so useful there. And I just kind of hung out there for five years, just uh, reading a lot of everything. I was like the, you know, a 13 year old kid reading the comics journal, just trying to figure out what comics were about and how to make yeah. them a lot of Cerebus. Ugh, that's a tragic story. Um, you know, a lot of independent stuff I got into, uh, you know, pirate Corps by heaven, Dork and milk and cheese. Um, all the, all the black and white indie boom stuff, turtles, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Scott McLeod Zot. That was a big influence. That was the kind of stuff I grew up reading and really loving and just going, wow, like creator owned is like the way to go. I don't want to grow up and do Spider-Man. I don't want to be a cog in the, the Marvel DC machine also because I can't draw that well. That helps. Yeah. Um, but I can do cartoony. So, yeah. And that's the kind of stuff I grew up um, gouging on. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my hometown didn't have a comic book shop. Um, yeah. uh, but I, I think the, like, the first comic book shop that I went to must have been when I was probably about 15 or 16 and it was in the city. Mm -hmm. um, but I was very lucky. Blow your mind? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and it was called Armageddon as well. <laughs> Armageddon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, uh, in my hometown, we, we were pretty lucky because there, there, was, um, there was a shop that, you know, it was mostly magazines and things like that and stationery. But, um, but there, were, there were a few kids that used to go there and buy lots of comics. I was one of them. And they really responded to that. And they, they really, they had a lot of comics and, and, you know, they really responded to us and what we wanted and they really listened. So it was good. It, it was a good relationship that we had there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great environment to be in. If like, you know, one of those bar flies at the comic shop, you know, I remember, yeah. I remember like putting together like a little, uh, I was like drawing, kind of stuff and I, I i showed some pages and i said oh do you think you know in a couple of years I, i'll be good enough to make a mini comic and he's like you can do that now and we'll put them up on the shelf <gasps> what that was that was amazing that's awesome so uh, you you were a game designer um i think yeah. uh, and what was that like and what was the turning point you know the moment that you decided you know what i want to dedicate myself to comics Okay, all right, we're gonna get real here. Um, actually, let, let, let me preface it. Ariel, like being a game designer is an absolute dream job. It's a, it's a job that like a lot of people go, wow, I wanna do that. And, and they think it's like, oh, you get to do your amazing ideas. And, and um, yeah, and you do, like you get a couple of days of unfettered creativity and then that's followed by two years of hard work to actually make those crazy ideas happen. It's a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of emails and a lot of like arguing with people and trying to make a compromise with their vision and your vision. And I did a lot of license stuff as well. So that also presented its own kind of challenges. Um, but it was a great job. It was a hell of a lot of fun. I got to travel, I got to meet people. It's, it's a great feeling. And it's the same with comics as well. It's a great feeling watching someone experience something that you've helped make. And then you watch them enjoy it. And it's like, wow, that's cool. I, I made their day a little bit better. That's all we can really ask for in, in this world, right? Um, but I remember the moment that I knew I had to get out. And it was, we were working on a movie license that we knew was going to tank. Like not through any fault of our own or even the people making the movie. It wasn't any of their fault. It was just a license that everyone, we just knew was just, no one asked for this. And um, no matter how much work we put into it, we were working on it for like two or three years, for close to three years. And, um, and I was sitting in an office with like 40, 45, 50 people who were also working on animators and artists and sound people and testers and programmers and all these incredibly smart, talented, hardworking people who were absolutely saddled with this license and this game that I was designing, but no one wanted. And... I remember sitting there one day and it was just eight hours, 10 hours, whatever of people just sitting there, just 
this game sucks. It's terrible. Why are we making this? This is horrible. Whose idea was this? This is garbage. Yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, this is killing me. I gotta go. Like, I feel bad for everyone having to work on this. I feel yeah. bad for me for actually making it happen because I'm the guy who sold the idea. Um, yeah, I gotta get out of here. This, I just wanna make comics because that way, if something sucks, I'm the only person that has to worry about it. Like, it's only my fault. Okay, well, I made something that sucked today. Okay, well, I'll try again tomorrow. Not mm -hmm. three years of working on this game that, like, no one wanted. And guess what? The movie tanked and no one thinks about the game. <laughs> so, yeah. So, well, behind. it was the right decision, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Wow, that's it. That's it's, a great it's a, it's story. It's a tough thing. It's a tough thing working on. I, I decided one of the things I wanted to do was not work on something that required so many people. Yeah. Because if it, you know, if it, if it tanks, I don't want to take down other people with me. And thankfully, most of them have gone on to bigger and better things. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, we'll talk about Rose soon. But you've created other comics before. Would you like to highlight one or two and where we can read them? Yeah, sure. Um, probably the the thing most people know me for before Rose was a comic called Blow the Cartridge, which was about retro gaming. So it was about all the old classic video games that we grew up playing on the Commodore sixty four or the Amiga or or the the you know the Mega Drive or whatever, um, or the Super Nintendo. And it was about all those kind of games. So it was like, you know, every uh, week I'd pick a different game and then do a little comic about it and then write up my experience about like, you know, the game itself. Cause like, I'm, I'm very much into that, the, the retro gaming stuff, um, the Super Nintendo, that, that kind of era, the Commodore 64, that's very much my jam. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much, that was probably the biggest thing before that before Rose came along. Um, after a while, I just went, okay, I've done like 400, 500 of these strips. I'm good. Uh, I think I've said everything I wanted to say about how great the Super Nintendo is. <laughs> I'm something different. And but that's still up. That's at blowthecartridge.com. Blowthecartridge.com. Excellent. Um, I, full confession here, I've never been a Nintendo guy. I've always, really? Yeah, I've always been a Sega guy. Well, I'm the same because like, you know, you grew up in Europe and that was very much a Sega territory. I, I listen to a lot of uh, retro gaming podcasts and it's all Nintendo, Nintendo, Nintendo. And it's like, don't get me wrong, you know, respect the heck out of it. But it was only popular in America and Japan. Yeah. Everywhere else was Sega territory. We grew up playing, you know, Sonic. Oh, yeah. That was yeah. our jam. Yeah, that was good. for me, for me, um, I mean, I, I respect Nintendo as a company, absolutely, yeah. and and they have some great games. But yeah, for me, it was a, uh, you know, it was a, it was a Master System, the Mega Drive, uh, Genesis, okay. like all those. Um, uh, my favorite game was Shinobi, um, yeah, and. Yes. Um, I, uh, something that I'm famous for in my hometown is that I was the first person to finish the Shinobi arcade game That's in my awesome. hometown. And by the time the second person finished it, I finished it with my first life. <laughs> One credit clear. Fantastic. Yeah. So it was, you know, so yeah, uh, I was that. famous for that. My 15 minutes of fame in my hometown. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> you have a very cartoonish style. And um, who were your influence, influences in developing your style? Oh, this might come as a huge shock, uh, but like old Archie books. Um, people like Dan DiCarlo and Harry Lucy in particular. Um, these days, you know, Dan Parent is doing some incredible stuff on the Archie lines. Um, I really just like that, that, that those, oh, um, Monta Jamie Hernandez on Love and Rockets, who was also very much inspired by Dan DiCarlo. Um, those clean lines, those, those big eyes, the big facial expressions, um, the, those great poses, all that kind of stuff. They're very much my um, uh, study, uh, study material. Um, I was also like really grew up um, very influenced by the energy of uh, Evan Dorkin, uh, who you know, did Milk and Cheese, he still does do Milk and Cheese. Um, and also Terry Moore, 
uh, who does Strangers in Paradise, and he's doing a book now called Ever, which is coming out later. Um, I read I read that maybe once a year, um, his stuff, and just look at the art and just go, wow, it's incredible. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, definitely growing up, um, a lot of the old Archie books. So I just love the way that it's it told a simple story and had packed some humor and it was a feel good kind of thing. Like you could hand it to anyone yeah. and they'd be able to read it and feel good five minutes later. It was, there was no dense continuity. There was no one feeling sad for 40 pages for, you know, $10 or whatever. It was just a, a feel good experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, where, when I was growing up, I, I never read Archie and mm. I'm, I'm actually wondering like whether it was published in Spain or not. I, I assume it was, but I don't remember it. I don't remember it as a kid. So I discovered that only when I came here to Australia and someone mentioned it and said uh, that they grew up on that. And um, yeah, so yeah, that's cool. Very interesting. Now, Rose is a series of comics and Rose and Dahlia is your third collected volume, third course. So what's Rose the comic and who is Rose? Ah, who is Rose? Uh, Rose is a young woman who is facing the big challenges in life, the big questions, um, are hot dog sandwiches. Um, can you have two breakfasts? Um, can you get away with doing nothing all day? All that kind of stuff. Um, she is an immigrant from Ireland who lives in Australia. Uh, she hangs out with her best friend, Dahlia, who's, um, Basically, they want to just hang out, make each other laugh, um, not do much except uh, just eat their body weight in curry and uh, have a good time while doing it. And it's their adventures. There's their slice of life adventures throughout the day, facing the big problems, you know, maybe uh, yeah, they have falling posters on their walls. That's a big issue. Um, you know, maybe they, they, they their boss is trying to get them to do stuff. They're trying to worm their way out of it uh maybe their favorite curry place is shut down for the day uh all, all the big issues in life that you know i really try to drink into um well i can yeah, really it's... i can really relate to that uh issue sure. of you know the the favorite curry place being closed it's yeah that, that would be really devastating to me oh no i can i, I completely commiserate with like everyone in melbourne at the moment it's like all their favorite places are either shut or too far away for them to deliver to or well actually uh i'm kind of lucky because my favorite thai place and thai curries are my favorite uh, my favorite thai place is actually close enough that they do deliver to our house so i'm okay <laughs> okay good good so i'll have to send a care package or something yeah no 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 shortage of red curry and masaman curry in this house no way <laughs> Kill me. Kill me. Yeah. Beautiful. So um, um, can you tell us about the origin of Rose and how did you come up with the character? How did the series develop? Did you, did you actually base the character on someone? Yeah. Um, so there's a friend of mine um, who... So I was doing Blow the Cartridge at the time and a friend of mine was making an anthology, uh, Greedy Gravy, Lucky in Brisbane, it's kind of a Brisbane legendary anthology been going for like 20 years. And he asked me, hey, can you do like a four page strip for me? And I went, yeah, I can do that, but I just don't know how I'm gonna make a blow the cartridge thing that goes for four pages. Actually, you know what? I wanna do something different. I'll do something that's a little bit more personal, a little bit more character based. I'm trying to like, you know, stretch out of just doing a, a gag strip. Um, and a friend of mine who was, uh, uh, or still is, a young Irish woman, who loves food um, said, Oh, you should do a comic about me about the time that I, you know, go and visit my gran in the nursing home and I wanted to feed everyone. And then I walked into the wrong room and I didn't recognize that it wasn't my gran. I started talking to her for 10 minutes and I felt bad that I didn't recognize her and, and the hilarity ensues. I went, okay, I'll do a little four page strip on that. And um, then I did that and that, went over pretty well. I went, actually, this is fun. I want to do another one of these. And I did another one and another one, another one. Before mm -hmm. I had, you know, before I knew it, I had 12 pages of material. And I went, oh, okay, I've got enough to do a little mini comic here. That's kind of cool. Like, I'll do it and I'll, I'll pack this away and I'll do a little mini comic and maybe some people like it. And then I'll just go back to doing the, you know, the, the 
Mega Drive jokes. Um, and then another friend of mine, and also my arch rival, uh, Sid Stones. Um, uh, uh, they were running a mini comic con uh, along with um, uh, some other people, and um, I put that out as a little on the little table, and they came up, and went, actually, you should do more of these. These are these are good. There's characters here that are actually interesting. I went, okay, and I did another one, and so I did you know the first issue. Always be plugging. Yeah. And um, yeah, and it kind of snowballed from there and people just liked it. And I went, I'll keep doing this then. And here we are five years later with three collections and a couple of video games and a graphic novel coming up. And yeah, so it kind of snowballed from there from, from just uh, friend suggestions to just. That's cool. So, so yeah. even, even your first story was already a collaboration, wasn't it? Mm. I guess, yeah. yeah. It kind it of gave like, you the story in a way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I've noticed that uh, you often collaborate with other people. So, w mm. what's that collaboration like? It's been interesting, actually. Like, I remember, like, the first couple of issues, um, I was very, oh, this is this is just something I do, and you know, like, I have other people. Oh, you know, I'd love to do that. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Um, but then, you know. Um, a trusted collaborator of mine, Jason Conlon, he wrote some strips for like some in the first issue somewhere. I think there's one that he wrote. Um, and then that kind of snowballed into that. And I went, actually, this is kind of fun. Um, and, you know, I've had some other people do some other strips. And now I'm working with my uh, creative collaborator, Corinne Thompson, who's, we're doing the graphic novel. And we've been doing a lot of strips together over the last couple of issues. And she's been incredible. Um, helped me write stuff. And it's actually, what I've found is it's actually expanded what the strip is and it's given me more characters. It's given me more scope of what it is. It's, it's, it's being able to bounce ideas off other people. Um, you know, I've written a strip with a couple of strips with my wife, which is great. Uh, she come up with silly ideas and I turn them into a comic and um, it's actually been a lot better. I, I, I'm mad that I took so long to get to that point. Actually, I really enjoy the collaborative process. It's, um, it's been illuminating and I don't want to go back. I, I think it's, it's made the strip a lot better. Mm. So definitely. And uh, yeah, it's good having a creative collaborator. It, it, yeah, it's, um, it, it's a really good thing when you find the right partner. Like uh, I, um, so a long time ago, I did media studies actually. So uh, yeah. uh, I've never written a comic uh, script, but, but I've written, I've written scripts for movies and have directed some short films and things like that. And, and um, yeah, especially when, uh, when I was living back in the Basque country, um, I, had a, I had a friend that we just bounced off each other really well, but our styles were at the same time quite different. So mm -hmm. it was great because he really challenged me in the things that yes. I wasn't that good at. You know, and I challenged him in other things as well. So we had lots of great arguments, you know, <laughs> but they were very productive arguments, you know. Yeah. So it, yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the great things about working with Karina is that, you know, she's challenged me to level up, you know, and, and think about things in a different way. And I've been able to challenge her to go, okay, this, how do things fit into this world that we're making? And um, <laughs> so, we're, yeah, we're doing the graphic novel together, which has been a really different process from how I usually think. I usually just go, okay, write it, first draft, put it into a comic, put it out the door, and no, we're writing and rewriting and second, third, fourth, fifth drafts and stuff like that. So it's been, yeah, yeah it's been a very different experience, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And I, I have to ask, so uh, um, Rose and Dahlia is all kind of like short stories, you know, a mm -hmm. few pages. So is the graphic novel going to be one yeah, Sorry. I haven't really talked about it um, publicly, but yeah, actually, uh, so it's um, Rose and Dahlia Go to Space. Uh, it'll be 80 to 100 pages as one solid story, beginning, middle and end, self-contained story. And that's been actually the biggest challenge, trying to think, like take the scope out so big and actually fa have them face real problems and go through character growth and develop new characters that they interact with and and make sure each character has a role to play. And um, 
yeah, it's been an incredible challenge so far putting together. Um, we're, we're posting updates to it um, on Patreon, but um, yeah, so far just keeping it under wraps for the moment. Hopefully we'll get it done by the end of the year. Sounds really uh, cool. I'm really excited. I'm really yeah, excited. So uh, how did you go about distributing your comics to library suppliers and what library suppliers stock it? Sure. Um, so my first technique didn't work, which was go to libraries and go, please take my book. And they, they politely usher me out the door um, because I was a crazy man with a box of books. Sorry um, about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, so I started getting in touch with a bunch of uh, library distribution companies and went, hey, here's my book. And one of them, uh, you know, they're, they're all very helpful, actually. They're all very helpful going, okay, slow down. This is what you need to do. These are the forms you need to fill out. This is the process you need to go through. Um, so I've had to learn about, you know, how to get an ISBN, um, how to get all the details together for the library information, all that kind of stuff. So uh, we're with Peter Powell and Australian Library Supplies. They've both been incredible. They, they, they carry the book and, they, and it's really, um, it's interesting actually because, you know, they distribute the book, but I don't know where it goes. So every now and then I'll get a photo from a, a reader going, hey, your book's in our library. I go, oh, that's cool. That's a good feeling. Um, yeah, so that, that's been incredible. So yeah, those two guys have been really great. And um, so yes, it's in all the libraries. So it's in those systems. So it should be in all the libraries across Australia. It's in some school libraries. Um, it's about, they carry it through Dimmix now, which is great. ALS and Peter Powell, I think, um, carry it through Dimmix, which is fantastic. I'm able to say, hey, you great. can go and buy it through academics that's nice um and also got a, a european distributor um who are carrying it in uh england and uae and africa and some other countries i can't remember offhand sorry i should know that um but yeah the, the library distributors are getting into that system because that's where i want the book to go um yeah. more than anything else i think the libraries are definitely the way to go it's where the kids get books from this is a kid friendly book yep. it's all ages but you know i mean it's aimed for for a young audience um <clears throat> and so so it ultimately those guys like i used to hand walk it to comic shops and go please carry my books and then i'd go back you know six months later and those books would still be on the shelf yeah. um you know it's i want to go where the audience is and if they're in libraries definitely i want to be in libraries Oh yeah. Um, look, uh, about, about going to libraries uh, directly, as, as you were doing, um, we do, it, it depends on the library. Uh, it depends on the library. Some are more open to other, uh, than others, but also if it's a local creator, we're more likely to get it. Um, but yeah, it can be tricky. But yeah, get, getting it through library suppliers is, is great. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you had a a great experience with them and oh, when i was cool. when i was checking for your books um we used peter powell and i was yeah. glad to see them there so <laughs> so that's awesome it's really good oh, yeah so aside from library suppliers where and how can people buy your comics okay so back in the day there used to be these things called comic conventions but yeah. anyway um <clears throat> so i i you know, do a couple of the, the cons every year if they're open. Um, but who knows what's happening with that anymore. Uh, on There's a bunch of comic shops around Australia. So a bunch in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. I think there was one in Perth. There's a couple in uh, all over the world, actually. We, we put Rose Books into there, which has been uh, an experience. Uh, but always through the shop, rosecomic.com slash shop, we have all the books available on our website. Just waiting. Look, they're back there. They're waiting for you. Come and get them. That's right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, now, for a little bit of fun, uh, because mm. so much of Rose is about food, I have to ask, are you a good cook? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'm more of a consumer than a creator on that side of things, uh, for sure. Yeah, no, I can, I can assemble things. You know, like, ah, oh, mate, I can knock out a sandwich. Not a problem. That's just assembly. That just comes from playing Burger Time back in the day, right? So, you know, yeah. I know how to do that. But, uh, 
No, I can look at a menu pretty darn well, though. Oh, <laughs> a menu. You're an expert at that. Yeah, <laughs> nail it. Excellent. So well, what's your favorite thing to eat? Ah, easy answer. Uh, Japanese katsu chicken curry. Beautiful. I love it. The smell, the flavors, the way you can experiment with different types of sauces, the rice. Oh, heaven. Just that smell. It's just, it's calming and, and aromatic and, and just, it's home. Mm. It's just, it's I love place. katsu curry. Oh, that's how I judge any, any local, you know, Japanese restaurant I go to. I go, first thing, right, what's your katsu curry like? And then I judge it from that beautiful it's, it was kind of inspiration i did um a year or two ago i did a new commodore 64 game called rose's curry clicker where like she collects curries and the ultimate prize was a, a japanese katsu curry that was the most valuable one <laughs> so i had to do a lot of research for that yeah that's awesome <laughs> yeah, that's definitely. awesome katsu curry. i mm. love katsu curry uh, but uh they are actually um in terms of Japanese food, my favorite is uh, actually a dish uh, called yaki soba, oh, yeah. uh, um, which is it's a it's an absolute favorite of mine, and that's how I judge Japanese restaurants. Yep, yep. that's Total if they have a that. good yaki soba, then I know that okay, that's a good place. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Um, so. Uh, katsu curry. What about dessert? Ooh, uh, deep fried ice cream is always good. Um, it's made me the man I am today, uh, grossly overweight. Um, what else? What else? Just, just, just good old chocolate. Sorry, you can't go past it. Mm. Gets me through the day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me with chocolate, I grew up with my mum always gave me dark chocolate. Oh, yeah. So, you know what? I, I eat dark chocolate um, yep. and milk chocolate. I have it only very rarely. And when I have it, it's kind of, it's too sweet for me. It's too sweet. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I, a friend of mine, she was saying, you know, oh, I've got this block of chocolate in my fridge and, you know, it's lasted like two weeks. I'm like, how? <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? Oh, you know, I, I'll have a little block every, you know, day or two. I'm like, what? Yeah. With, with my mum, like, yeah, my, uh, you know, um, yeah, bonding times with my mum uh -huh. in the kitchen, um, always chocolate, dark chocolate, yep. and uh, chorizo. We both oh. share an absolute passion for chorizo. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, in the kitchen, my mum and I used to just secretly have this little bit of chorizo <laughs> <laughs> before dad noticed. <laughs> and oh, then he was beautiful. like, where did all the chorizo go? I just went to the butchers yesterday. I'm like, oh, oh, it was sorry. bad. We had to throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, no, this has been a great conversation. But at the end, um, we... Uh, would you like to share two or three comics or graphic novels that you've read recently and can recommend to others? Okay. Um, so I'm going to sound like real basic, but actually, no, I, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend Raina tell, tell I'm sorry. Okay, my, uh, last night, so yeah. Thank you. Her stuff is like my top tier. Like that is what I want to be doing kind of, of stuff. I adore her work. And it's always interesting, like, um, at conventions or workshops uh, that I do, is uh, I'll talk to the kids and go, oh, do you read comics? And some of them will go, no. And then I go, oh, so have you read any of Rainer's stuff? And I go, oh, yeah, 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 I love yeah. her stuff. And I'm like, you read comics. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're, you're in. Like, you, you, you know what great comics are already. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah, so I've just finished Guts and um, absolutely loved that one. Um, what a great book. Oh, what a great just, book. And yeah. he makes it seem, uh, when I read it, I just thought, like, she, she makes it seem so effortless. It seems so easy yeah. to her. Yes. But at the same time, it's just so well done. So well done. Oh, it kills yeah. me how effortless it looks. It's like, and I know it's not. I know it's so much work. Yeah. But, ah. Oh. Yeah, love, love, love her stuff. 
Um, I just finished reading um, Seconds by uh, Brian Lee O'Malley, who did uh, Scott Pilgrim. So it's about, like, it, I thought it would appeal to me. It's about this young redhead woman who runs a kitchen and, you know, she's trying to, like, um, come up with, with a new restaurant that will do as well as you know, her earlier effort. I can see there's a lot of autobiographical stuff with Brian Lee O'Malley trying to follow up Scott Pilgrim and, you know, mm-hmm. the pressures with that, I imagine. Uh, I really enjoyed that. That was that was a lot of fun. I wasn't expecting um, something great. But I'll tell you what, um, and I, I talked a little bit about before, but Terry Moore um, did a book called How to Draw. And I read that once a year, every year, and I always learn something new from it. And I always end up just crying at the end because I'm like, I'll never be this good. Oh, God. <laughs> and... Um, and, but uh, so he's coming up with a new version of that next year. So I can't wait for that expanded um, edition of that. And uh, I thoroughly recommend Terry Moore's How to Draw. Um, and also, yeah, uh, of course, I'm sure it's in libraries everywhere, but Scott McLeod's Understanding Comics, that was a, a huge deal for me when I was like 14, 15 or whatever. And um, that kind of really broke down. Oh my God, this is how it works. And this is, yeah, hey, I want to make something that I can. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, um, you don't need to be the best, uh, artist in the world. You, not everyone needs to be more abuse, you know? <laughs> oh God. No. I mean, he is my I'm... idol. He is my yeah. favorite artist and I grew up on his comics. Um, uh, yeah. you know, but not everyone needs to do that. I mean, the best selling comic in the world now is uh dog man. And, yeah. <laughs> And that's great. And it's amazing. It's amazing. And you know, kids just can't have enough of it. Yeah. So I realized really early on that I'll never be able to draw like a superhero book. Like I just don't have that eye for anatomy or yeah. muscular, you know, dynamic poses and all that kind of stuff. What I'm good at is two people sitting in a room talking. And so I try to craft everything around that. Yeah. So it's about leaning on your strengths, really. Yeah, it's about the story, it's about the characters, it's about that, and, uh, that, and that's what you're offering. And, uh, you know, I, I really loved uh, uh, Rose and Dahlia, so oh, great. I, I, I recommend it. Uh, so, you know, one last plug, where can we find more info on you and Rose? Uh, come to rosecomic.com. Everything is there. You can read lots of comics for free. You can come check out the shop. Uh, you can go to our Patreon where we post new strips and behind the scenes stuff. I do work in progress stuff. I do bonus comics just for Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Cameron Davis. Um, but yeah, come to rosecomic.com and, and check it out from there. Excellent. And for libraries, uh, it was ALS and Peter Powell. And Peter Powell. Yeah, we have links to them on our website as well. Excellent. So uh, thank you, Cameron, for taking time for this creative chat. We really, really appreciate it. And no worries. Uh, you think things mate. continue well in Queensland. Yeah, and I hope things get better in Melbourne, mate. Looking forward to being able to come back down there again. Yes, yes. Hopefully. <laughs> Who knows what the future will bring. <laughs> All good. So yeah, thank you. Take care. All right. Thanks, mate. Bye.